What has happened to dissent in America during the COVID crisis? Have women in particular become voiceless subjects of pharmaceutical power? Are concerns about COVID tyranny overblown or should we be worried? We'll discuss all this and more with special guest Naomi Wolf on this episode of Independent Conversations. Hello everybody, I'm Graham Walker coming to you today from the Independent Institute here in Oakland, California. We're right across the bay from San Francisco. And uh, we try and give you a take on the issues of the day that does not always fit into standard categories, but instead takes an independent look. And as I said, <clears throat> I'm joined today by author and cultural commentator, Dr. Naomi Wolf. Welcome, Dr. Wolf. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. It's, it's a real pleasure. Thank you. And, you know, I'm calling uh, you Dr. Wolf because you earned a DPhil from Oxford uh, after you had gone to Yale, if I've got that right. <clears throat> so you come by your your doctoring, uh, honestly. Doctoring. Uh, thank you, but please call me Naomi now that you've called me Dr. Wolf. Okay. Dr. Wolf, I shall henceforth call you Naomi. <laughs> thank you very much. But um, actually, before Oxford, before Yale, you were in San Francisco. Were you born and raised in San Francisco? I was, yes. Uh -huh. uh, and yeah. what neighborhood did you did you grow up in? So uh, Parnassus Heights, right above the Haight-Ashbury. Oh, yeah. Forest, right. That magical forest, beautiful part of the city. It really is a beautiful part. Yeah. And, and you went to Lowell High School, I think. Yes, I did. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Which actually has been in the news recently. We're going to talk about this, but it has been in the news recently because this remarkable recall election pivoted on the effort of some school board members to basically decommission Lowell from its original mission and get rid of the uh, merit-based entry there. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Very surprising. Definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, and you are known for so many interesting things. It's a great privilege to, to talk with you this way, uh, Naomi, if I'm getting used to saying that. Um, you wrote this remarkable book, The Beauty Myth, some years back. Um, we're not going to linger on it, but can you tell us why uh, it was praised by Betty Friedan and Gloria Steinem? And can you tell us why The New York Times called The Beauty Myth one of the most important books of the 20th century? Yeah, that was nice. <laughs> sure. Wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was good. Um, so yeah. the beauty myth, I wrote it when I was a, a tiny child. I was 26 years old. And um, it kind of came out of my first sojourn at Oxford. Uh, I had been a Rhodes Scholar and tried to write about feminist theory, which didn't really exist at that time, certainly not at that university. Um, and I was kind of told by my advisor, this way of seeing the world doesn't exist here, so go write a book. Um, uh, so I did. Uh, and it happened to sort of hit at the right time culturally because- mm -hmm. uh, What year was that? So that came out in, I think, 1993. Oh, and, yeah. and that was the right time. It was because the my mother's generation of feminists, the second wave, had kind of had their great moment in the 70s and changed all these- institutions done very important work, but the ideology and the discourse of 70s feminism wasn't resonating for women of my generation. Right. So uh, it basically updated Betty Friedan's um, The Feminine Mystique, which many mm -hmm. of are familiar with, and basically made the case that uh, just as housework was the kind of ideology that was imposed on post-war uh, middle-class American women to kind of keep them quiescent and, you know, from being political and agents of change. Right. The in, 50s stereotype. Yes. In our generation at that time, the, you know, late 80s into the early 90s, um, it was these impossible ideals of, you know, very rigid ideals of physical beauty, uh, including, you know, I have a chapter on anorexia, a chapter on cosmetic surgery, and mm. it was kind of a deconstruction of that ideology that you have to be one way. Um, and the argument that really the purpose of those restrictions was to distract and exhaust women. So we wouldn't be clamoring for uh, more equality. You did a few other things since then, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, well, you were a Rhodes Scholar, I guess, just before you wrote the book. Later, you became known for your advising presidential candidates, including Bill Clinton's reelection and Gal Al Gore's almost successful run for the presidency. Uh, you've appeared in virtually every major news outlet in the U.S. and many globally, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> I think you've appeared with regular columns in The Guardian, The Sunday Times of London, and more. So... All of that is a lot to accomplish. Thank you for reading my actual bio instead of the Wikipedia 
you know, horror show of <laughs> cherry picked nonsense. Yes. Thank you. I've been very busy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you've been busy. Um, <clears throat> you've been taken seriously by a lot of people who uh, needed to take you seriously. Uh, you've made a dent in the way people have thought about the role of women in our culture and society. Um, all of that, as far as I can see, for the good, <clears throat> you haven't kept your mouth shut over the years. You've kept observing American life. And uh, I've been noticing your writings recently. Uh, two, uh, well, a month ago, early, early January, you published uh, a remarkable piece on Substack, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Oh, but first I have to mention your current venture. Yeah, backtrack for a moment. Your current venture is um, <clears throat> Clout, Daily Clout. Yes. And if they want to visit your website, they go to dailyclout.io, right? Yes. And there they will get resources to become equipped for civic action and awareness. Yep. You can write your own laws and pass them. It's pretty awesome. We yeah. also have a legislative database where you can look up any state or federal bill and share it through social media. It's socially interactive. So we, uh, we are running a really important campaign right now called the Five Freedoms Campaign. It's been really successful where we hired a lawyer to draft model bills to ban vaccine passports, no mask mandates, open schools, um, free assembly and end emergency law. And uh, we were, our readers and our, our community were, I think, instrumental in uh, rolling back some of the worst of the tyrannies in 33 states where they did pass anti-vaccine mandate. Mm -hmm. I think this whole, whole question of how to deal with COVID has proved uh, to, to be shedding a light on a lot of things unexpectedly. And when I read your piece in Substack, uh, where you have a column regularly that you, you post things there too, um, I, I saw this remarkable piece. I, I'm going to read um, a few sentences from you, Naomi, and invite you to elaborate a little bit for our friends who are with us on this call. <clears throat> so here's what you said last month. I think this was January 9th. You published it yeah, on your Substack column. <clears throat> and you said this. <clears throat> the rest of the world, at least on the progressive side in the United States, became increasingly cult-like and insular in its thinking since March of 2020. As the months passed, friends and colleagues of mine who were highly educated and who had been lifelong critical thinkers, journalists, editors, researchers, doctors, philanthropists, teachers, psychologists, all began to repeat only talking points from MSNBC and CNN, and soon overtly refused to look at any sources, even peer-reviewed sources in medical journals, even CDC data that contradicted those talking points. These people literally said to me, I don't want to see that, don't show it to me. <clears throat> it became clear soon enough that if they absorbed information contradictory to the narrative, quote unquote, that was consolidating at that time, they risked losing social status, maybe even jobs, drawers would close, opportunities would be lost. So you began to blow the whistle, in other words, about COVID issues and governmental responses and the emerging narrative. Um, what did you mean by what you said here? It's kind of shocking. What did I mean by what I said? Yeah, I mean, when you, when you say, good grief, that, that, that there's been an insular turn in thinking, even on the progressive side. I thought progressives were known to be sort of like free thinkers, question authority. Remember that whole thing? <clears throat> I mean, I, I take it one step further. Sadly, I see insular and cult-like thinking primarily on the progressive side right now. And I say that with a lot of sadness. Um, I've always been proud to be a classical liberal, uh, you know, often been proud to call myself a progressive. And to me, that has always stood for a great tradition dating back to the 19th century and actually to the enlightenment of um, human rights, freedom of speech, uh, critical thinking, um, uh, real science, you know, mm -hmm. uh, interrogating science, um, criticism of authority, uh, the right to protest. Um, uh, openness of of thought and uh, freedom of association, tolerance, right? I mean, that really is what liberalism, classical liberalism was, especially in Europe in the 19th century. It literally mm -hmm. meant tolerance and, you know, I'm Jewish. It meant that, pe you know, people who were excluded should have civil rights, should have opportunities in society, should be part of the larger community um, and should be judged on merit. And, uh, <clears throat> Never, never in a million years would I recognize what I've believed 10 years ago. It's so quickly th these 
heirs, you know, this tribe of people who are supposed to stand for these civilized norms, you know, with this great lineage, would do a volt fuss in less than two years that reduces them to lockstep cult-like, um, rigid policers of other people's choices, rigid supporters of what has become a two-tier society. I mean, I'm literally on the phone with my kids, you know, right before I got on this call, trying to find a restaurant in New York City where we can sit indoors because I'm not vaccinated. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, you know, everyone I know and love is not out in the streets. Pro I'm not talking about my children now, I'm talking about like my friends, my larger community, you know, they were out in the streets for South Africa. They were out in the streets for civil rights. They were out in the streets for <clears throat> LGBTQ rights. You know, why are they suddenly okay with a vast number of people being literally discriminated against as if we are untouchables um, and, and disproportionately black and Hispanic people being discriminated against as if we are untouchables. Um, I could go on and on, but in terms of the COVID narrative, it's not really that I'm blowing the whistle on COVID. I'm, right, doing, right. I'm doing like, the thing that's surprising to me, Mr. Walker, is- Call me Graham. Thank you, Graham, <laughs> is that um, I'm being reacted to as if I've somehow become an apostate to the left because right. I talk to conservatives and I talk to libertarians. Well, I haven't moved. I'm right. saying the exact same things mm -hmm. I've always said. I'm not cr uh, particularly a critic of the COVID narrative. I'm a critic of the COVID narrative because I've always been a critic of authoritarianism. Of dominant narratives. 2008, correct. And I've always been a critic of inequality. And I've always been a critic of, you know, cult-like thinking and, and s subservience to authority. So, so I haven't moved, you know, uh, and I guess that's what I would say to your question. I, I mean, it's a very scary time in history and we could talk more about my analysis of how so much cult-like thinking has developed. Um, mm -hmm. in we'll my come back to that. Community, but yeah, we'll come. Yeah. We'll definitely come back to that part of the equation. Um, on some of the COVID-related stuff, I was struck by your analysis where you pointed out the ways in which women, in particular, have not been well served by the public health establishment or by this new kind of uh, co coherent, uh, uniform mindset. Uh, among pro progressive thinking people. For example, this part was really fun in your Substack where you, you commented by people that you know who would only shop at Whole Foods and would, would only put Burt's Bees on their baby's bottoms, would only use sunscreen without pavas and, and would never have a hint of red dye number two and so forth. And yet uh, they're offering up their bodies to inject things in that were not have not been demonstrated as being sufficiently safe. To question those things, you would thought that those were the kind of people who would be interested in the questioning. You, you're kind of blowing the whistle on big pharma and saying that women have been subjected as kind of guinea pigs in the big pharma experimentation. How have women fared under the COVID regime? Yeah, Graham, that is a, <clears throat> one of the most important questions to ask right now. Women are 52% of human beings. And so <clears throat> their health issues are human health issues. And right now, I mean, first what I wanna say is the spokespeople for women's health who have been sounding the alarm, championing women's health, being critical of big pharma, critical of you know the long history of women's bodies being basically medical experiments. And I'm not exaggerating, you know, going back to hysterectomies when you are angry mm. or thalidomide, uh, you know, mm -hmm. or, you know, vaginal mesh, we don't need to get into too much detail, but that turned out to be catastrophic or, you know, birth control pills that cause strokes because they were too high in estrogen level, um, on and on and on, too high C-section rates, saline breast, you know, breast implants, uh, silicone rather than saline breast right. implants, mm -hmm. that's what called. Um, we know, we know this, any educated feminist person, let alone a feminist health activist, knows that there are decades of pharma and big medicine, basically rolling out the latest thing that makes a lot of money on women's bodies and then kind of saying, oh, sorry, when things go horribly wrong. 
we we know this, right? It's not new. Um, and we also know that the science has been wrong about women and women's health over and over and over. I mean, the science used to think women had smaller brains. You know, the science, you know, under Galen used to think that women's uteruses traveled around their bodies and, you know, made them insane. I mean, you could go, the science led to clitoridectomies in, you know, to calm people down in the 19th century. This was mainstream medical science. We know it's sexist. We know it's culturally inflected. We know it's, you know, inflected by the profit motive. So now all of these women who are supposed to be standing up for women's health are silent crickets. And I start to hear uh, individual reports on social media of women having menstrual dysregulation, bad menstrual dysregulation. I don't, again, want to get too granular if, you know, people are uncomfortable with that, but horrible things that anyone would know is not okay. So I'm called bat s crazy by Matt Gertz of CNN for reporting on this and uh, shortly thereafter deplatformed. Uh, but sure enough, a year and a half later, the CDC and other uh, peer reviewed studies show that um, the mRNA vaccines are having such a dramatic negative effect on women's <clears throat> menstrual health that women are menstruating an average of 12 days more a year, which if women were told wow. that, you know, before they got their vaccine, it would give a lot of women thought a pause because we don't have to be geniuses to know that um, healthy uh, menstrual cycle is directly related to healthy reproduction, right? We learned that in third grade. Mm -hmm. So, so to me, it is stunning that women are not speaking up for women who are supposed to speak up for women. I looked at our bodies ourselves, the the Women's Health Collective, the Boston Women's Health Collective. Still decades, very influential. Decades, they've been at the forefront of women's health. Crickets, nothing on vaccine side effects. And, uh, and you know, I could go on and on. Feminists, feminist moms are okay with their little girl children being masked in a way that interferes with their ability to speak. These are women who for decades that I've been a feminist activist have been talking about, you know, girls' voices and raising the voices of young girls. And yeah, you know, closing their young. voices up. Exactly. And mm -hmm. it's it's just shocking to me that, and, and lastly, I'll just say lastly, you know, the feminist like holy grail is my body, my choice, right? Reproductive rights, my body, my choice. So we've all believed that since we were 15 years old. and and. And Elaine Kagan and Elena Kagan and, and um, Justice Sotomayor also argue that when the issue is reproductive rights and abortion, they were talking about that in, in the Texas decision, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and then four weeks later, they yield that decision when it comes to mandates where you have to yield your body to the state just to be allowed mm -hmm. to go back to school, to be allowed to go back to work. So it's this cognitive mm -hmm. dissonance and this abandonment of a, a moral obligation mm -hmm. to to one's own gender that i find stunning and shocking and a, a dark moment in history back in what around spring of 2020 when this was hitting the us as a major pandemic um a decision was made uh you know, governmentally that we had to uh, emb embark on what former President Trump called Operation Warp Speed. Uh, and so, of course, because it was going to be an emergency context, uh, the federal government gave uh, the big pharmaceutical companies a legal liability exemptions <clears throat> from what would otherwise could have been, you know, liability for consequences. That enabled Operation Warp Speed to zoom ahead. <clears throat> and uh, so, uh, they didn't have to worry about the consequences. Right. <clears throat> and so I'm hearing, you know, when you talk in my ears ringing the history of missteps in pharmaceutical and chemical development. Mm -hmm. But at that point, it seemed too urgent. And what was striking to me is that that there was this combination. On the one hand, the federal government gave Big Pharma exemption from liability. And at the same time, elite opinion, at least in you know major media, legacy media, universities, cultural institutions, corporate world, uh, opinion coalesced around the essential nature of this. And anyone who questioned uh, the headlong pursuit of mass vaccination under an emergency youth authorization was kind of crazy. Uh, you described yourself as being kind of targeted that way. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to understand how there could be a coalescence of, of elite opinion around uh, a governmental initiative 
which which itself legally created the conditions where there could be protection against a negative fallout. The, the combination of opinion and power and legal power uh, is what strikes me about the situation, especially given what you said. Yeah, well, you're right to look at that because it's everything about the coercive rollout is illegal, right? If there was an experimental treatment and no one was coerced and everyone was given informed consent, those are the yeah, that's that different. people yeah. volunteer to to do that. Um, you know, people who are very ill volunteer to be part of experimental trials for AIDS drugs or cancer drugs or mm -hmm. so on. I would have no problem with that. But everything about the coercive nature of the rollout and and the purchase by the Gates Foundation, which has been documented in the Columbia Journalism Review of major news outlets like PBS, The Guardian, the BBC, uh, the New York Times, um, COVID education, right, uh, led to a circumstance where people did not have uh, informed consent and they did not have uh, freedom from medical coercion. And that is just flat illegal. And that's why you're going to see a lot of lawsuits. We did a webinar last night on Daily Cloud of a lawyer who's suing uh, school boards and universities for coercive mm. mandates because mm -hmm. it's it's against international law. It's against mm -hmm. um, the Geneva Conventions. It's against the Nuremberg Code. It's against the ADA. It's against you know the AMA's own ethics code. You cannot inject. You know you can't treat people against their will. You can't. So everything about <clears throat> the rollout was illegal. And I I think, I guess what I want to say too about the vaccine, I am not an anti-vaxxer. Like that's one of the- Yeah, I didn't smears. think you were. Yeah, that's one of the smears that were was aimed right. at me by the highly bought off mainstream media that, you know, participated in the uh, erasure, you know, the attempted erasure again of my reputation upon my deplatforming. But um, I come, from, you know, I'm, I'm CEO of a tech company, uh, even though I did need help finding um, the notifications uh, button on Twitter. <laughs> uh, but I am CEO of a successful tech company. And um, one of dailyclout.io. Thank you. One of the things I was aware of is that when I read the Moderna website early on, was that they were, first of all, promoting the injections as. Mm -hmm. Um, they were appealing to investors with their market advantage being that people would need multiple injections as opposed to just one, which is a traditional vaccine. So that was their market, you know, ad advantage that they're. And so I said before anyone had ever heard the bo word boosters, there are going to be boost, like there are going to be mm -hmm. multiple injections of this. That's their business model. And the other thing that that freaked me out is that the technology they were using to deliver the mRNA code was um, nano, lipid nanoparticles. So these are fat kind of glob, globules <clears throat> with the mRNA inside of them. And it's very exciting technology, it goes to every cell. So I read, I read the, the, <laughs> the website and I'm like, this goes to every cell, this new delivery mm -hmm. system goes to every cell in the body. That includes and, a lot of particular cells. Exactly, it includes the blood brain barrier, it includes the you know, amniotic sac, it includes the endometrium in women, all of these really important, you know, lymph fluid, like really important things that mm -hmm. you, I could not visualize as a layperson could successfully be um, imbricated, you know, with a novel technology uh, so systematically and something that really struck me, two things, I promise this riffle and soon, but a lot of doctors were pressuring me to get vaccinated and I would ask them, do you know where the spike protein goes? And none mm. of them could answer that. And they thought the injection stayed in the bicep or in the muscle. And I knew from reading the website that the claim you know, to investors was it doesn't stay in the muscle, it goes to every cell in your body. And the other thing that freaked me out was that I, when I looked up lipid nanoparticles, the it wasn't the medical journals that were excited about them so much as the the tech journals uh the 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 technology like biotech you know and 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 big tech was excited about lipid nanoparticles because it's a a technology that allows um that allows the human body to be hacked in a way that 
and don't take me out of context. I know that, you know, this quote has been taken out of context, but literally like Wired Magazine, um, Google, you know, a lot of tech coverage of lipid nanoparticles was excited that you can, for instance, um, harvest data from the human body if you've got an injectable that can, for instance, measure, you know, the heart rate or um, measure whether a medicine has gone to a certain, you know, place in the body that it needs to go. So knowing the pressures on technological, you know, advances, the pressures to have a big, uh, you know, exit, you know, be bought up by a larger company, um, understanding those pressures and how excited Wired Magazine was about this technology, that led to my decision not to put it in my body early. Wow. Well, now, you know, you, you mentioned a minute ago, um, people, if they had informed consent, it'd be one thing, but if they're forced to have a vaccine, that's another thing. That's an important distinction to you, right? Right. Yeah, it it's, like, well, it's, it's, it's not just important to me, it's the law. Yeah, well, okay, so it's the law. So then, you know, some of us are wondering, I can imagine some of our viewers are, are, are thinking with us here, so who exactly has been forced to get a vaccine? I mean, Naomi, uh, yourself, you've acknowledged that you have chosen not to, so we're not being forced to get a vaccine, but there's more to the story, isn't there? Is anybody really getting forced? <clears throat> well, I mean, I hope that's a rhetorical question, because it is, I want you yeah. to, <laughs> because I, I think it's those assumptions. Like I, I actually have heard other people in my former privileged social circles say things like that. And mm -hmm. it's one reason I'm not that comfortable in my former privileged social mm -hmm. circles, because a lot of people are being forced to get vaccinated. Um, you and I might be like, oh, well, I'll just like lie around in my, you know, fabulous apartment and you know, <laughs> do something else, you know, but um, most people don't have that privilege. And so when people have to, you know, I, I my inbox is full of hundreds of heartbreaking emails from people. Mm. Saying, my daughter loves her job at you know, the Department of Fish and Game. But if she doesn't get a vaccine, she will lose everything. She'll lose her benefits. My son is so proud to be a Marine, but if he doesn't get a vaccine, he'll be discharged, you know, and lose everything and have to start over. Um, but, you know, people just need to feed their families. And and most people just need to feed their families. So, you know, right. people want to go back to school. I mean, you and I are done with our educations. I know even privileged affluent parents who are distraught because their children can't go back to the campus because, you know, unless they get injected, which is going to lead to so many lucrative lawsuits, but it's a complete abuse. What, what, what is that teaching our children? Right. I mean, there's a gendered aspect to this, which is it's, it's feminizing every body, right. Men and women, it's feminizing them in the sense that it's saying to our sons and our daughters, you can be controlled, you can be coerced, you can be subjugated, you can be dominated, and something can be put in your body without your will. And if you don't see the gender dynamics there, you know, it's it's clear to see. But it's, it, you know, um, I, I know someone who, who has cognitive deterioration after having been vaccinated, and he did it with family pressure so he could help his son in college at fancy school, uh, you know, unpack for his semester, you know, back at school. I mean, he just, you know, we've been, we've been, we, we've had a reality constructed in which if we want to have a normal life <clears throat> with human contact and <clears throat> opportunities, we have to do it. And, you know, choice, right? If I know so many people who are even privileged people who are scared to not keep getting vaccinated because they're scared that they won't be up for that <clears throat> next promotion or that they won't mm -hmm. be included in their bridge club. Or, you know, I have very talented friends in the film industry who, if people know they're not vaccinated, you know, they won't be able to work. Well, they can't work on Hollywood films, you know, and, and on and on and on. So it's, um, it's all crashing down now. I'm sure you've been following the news. Oh, yeah. Uh, about these disclosures. I've been screaming about the data being wrong for 18 months and I've been screaming about, um, about, about fraud having been, you know, committed uh, for, for a long time. But now we've got other voices who understand more clearly the impact on markets like Ed Dowd pointing out that, you know, there's implosion because fraud will soon be even more completely revealed. But and people are are kind of sadly going to wake up probably i mean i think it's notable that 
some people who have ghosted me for two years are starting to call me mm. again, like nothing ever happened. <laughs> oh, man. Well, but, yeah. <laughs> but but I, mean, I guess just where I would like to wrap up that riff is that uh, it's, you know, we've been through a, a mass hallucination and people, there's wreckage, you know, people have been injured, people have died, but what's... <clears throat> going to last like there have been terrible things in human history that hurt people physically black plague tuberculosis but what is lastingly going to hurt us is that our our western way of life has been mm -hmm. destroyed and our 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 liberties and our culture and our culture mm -hmm. of equality our culture of you know human connection has been destroyed and and that's something i'm writing about a lot yeah, it's interesting. Oftentimes, <clears throat> when you look at education, for example, um, many progressive educational theorists have emphasized for decades the, the power of socialization, the socialization process. <clears throat> well, there's a lot of truth in that insight. Um, but, but for that very reason, when you talked about a few minutes ago about children, including little girls, being forced to be muzzled for months and months on end, <clears throat> that has a socialization. It, it, it's a suppression of so natural socialization that's bound to have social and emotional and psychological consequences, uh, especially odd since the evidence that we do have seems to suggest that young children are the least vulnerable, uh, yeah. apparently, to COVID. Yeah. Um, you know, it's one thing to recommend to those with comorbidities or above a certain age or you know, especially vulnerable. It's one thing to recommend that they be vaccinated. It's another thing to push for as massive and widespread as possible and masking and so forth. It, it seems to be a overkill from what knowledge we do have. Well, and again, going back <clears throat> to the pre-2020 world, you know, all of these things would have been recommendations, right? Back when we mm. made choices about risk, when we made choices about, I mean, I lived through the HIV, the, the height of the HIV epidemic, and it, it was horrible. And, and hundreds of thousands of people died horrible deaths. But and some crazy people said, let's lock up HIV positive <clears throat> people in a quarantine kind of situation. Let's make sure they don't, you know, that they're not intimate with other people. I mean, similar kinds of insane voices. But um, we held on to our civil society. And what it meant was that every and I remember these deliberations, every single person had to assess risk, very serious risk for mm -hmm. him or herself. And, and we did. Right. And, right. you know, some people got sick and died, you know, which is super tragic. But if we had locked down everyone and prevented everyone from being intimate with everyone because of the chance that someone might be HIV positive or someone might get sick um, is you know that's the end of that's the end of a free civil society and and the people the leaders of the lgbtq community were saying don't discriminate don't lock people down don't you know keep people from being part of the human community um mm -hmm. you know we need to make our own decisions about this and that was the right the right approach we you know we we lived through it with our rights intact no one promises human beings in a free society safety from everything the the definition of freedom is it has risk you know i mean too bad like not too bad like every death is a tragic one every risk that turns into a car accident or a you know someone smoking and getting lung cancer or whatever is tragic um no one deserves you know to to be a casualty but we've lived through epidemic after epidemic after epidemic before I mean, I've just been writing about this, you know, during two tuberculosis <clears throat> epidemics, Jung was establishing psychoanalysis conferences all over Europe. You know, what mm. would have happened to that effort if, you know, they'd been locked down because there was rampant tuberculosis, you know, during the 1840s, I wrote about this in Outrages, there was a huge uh, cholera and typhus epidemic in, in London tens of thousands of people died horrible deaths. Um, Charles Dickens wrote his masterpieces. Uh, you know, Charlotte Bronte wrote her masterpiece. Um, you know, they, mm. these authors were traveling to London, meeting their friends. They were assessing their own risk. And right. we, you know, by, by the same token, London could have locked down and, and, you know, had no culture and no human civilization. 
human beings just didn't do that before March of 2020. And as Michael Singer points out in Snake Oil, and he's very good on this, um, you know, this was lockdowns of this kind are more characteristic of North Korea or China than of free societies. They've never happened in a free society. And, and they're Xi Jinping's idea. And, and the effect right. is, as we're seeing, to destroy the West, to weaken the West, and, and to your point about masks, absolutely to damage and destroy and weaken our children and turn them into not Western children. Yeah, not Western. That's a very key way of framing it. And that's not ethnocentric. It's the result of a long civilizational uh, struggle to think carefully about how to evaluate risk and how to appreciate freedom, <clears throat> if, I'm if I'm hearing you right. Risk cannot be eliminated. <clears throat> and what's especially ironic about it is that usually when uh, societies organize <clears throat> to eliminate risk, they have to use power, right? So power can, is deployed to control behavior to eliminate risk. That's kind of the well, logic I, of it. I mean, Graham, respectfully, I'd kind of flip that around. I okay. mean, I've studied a lot of closing societies. What happens is tyrants will invoke safety. Invoke, or, or yeah. Invoke a, right. an existential mm -hmm. threat. In fact, that's step one of the 10 steps. Invoke a terrifying internal and external threat uh, in order <clears throat> to control everyone. Um, and people buy it because they're scared, right? But what I have been trying to warn people about for 12 years now and nonstop in the last two years is that it's actually more dangerous. A like you think that a controlled tyrannical society in which you're all right. you know, yeah. kept under lock and key because of public health and your breathing is monitored is safer. It is so much more dangerous right. to give it's up so much more autonomy and, and freedom. And, and look, you know, again, that the history of feminism should so inform people about this. They start with swabbing your nose. In China, they do anal swabs, right? And that I actually wrote about that. I and mean, sorry to get graphic, but in outrages, I talked about how gay men in the 19th century had these anal exams, which were partly to terrorize them and to shame them and to show them that the state could control them. Women who were uh, arrested for uh, alleged prostitution, really for just being free in their movements and circulating at night. Um, they had intrusive vaginal exams, right? Yeah. Um, I won't, I'll move on from bodily orifices, but it's germane, right? Okay. Why do people think that if they say, okay, we're going to inject you once, twice, three times, if you don't keep up with your injections, we'll exclude you from society. Why do people think they won't then say, okay, time for your, you know, hysterectomy, time for your, your, you know, to have one child, time for you to have a forced abortion, which is what- Time for your euthanasia. <clears throat> exactly right. I don't know why people don't see that obvious slippery slope. Once you've breached, you know, the, <clears throat> the bodily integrity of a human being, <clears throat> no one in history has ever stopped there once they had that power. And, and our own history of slavery shows it. Right, the things that were done to slaves were done to them because they were slaves, because they didn't have any rights to bodily integrity. Enlightened opinion seems surprisingly ready to embrace these restrictions on freedom, um, <clears throat> not seeing that the consolidation of power will actually threaten freedom far more, uh, and, and you won't, and you have far more risk <clears throat> rather mm -hmm. than you thought you're getting rid of risk. You're going to introduce a new and much more potent source of risk. Yeah. Uh, we can't eliminate risk. We have to deal with it uh, intelligently and individually even. Yeah. Uh, one interesting thing that you also have been speaking about recently, uh, Naomi, is the fact that not only students and employees and government workers, but also truckers in particular, um, found that they couldn't exercise their livelihoods unless they got the vaccine. In Canada, although the vast majority of truckers were vaccinated, they decided that on principle, a great number of them decided that on principle, it was unacceptable. And of course, the convoy started from British Columbia, ended up in Ottawa. Yeah, they were honking their horns a bit too much, uh, and maybe they're running their engines too long. I don't know. But but they had a pretty important point. And when you were commenting uh, earlier this month on the Canadian government's reaction to the truckers' rejection of mandates and coercion, you said that you, what you saw was a bid for Canadian tyranny, which was a, a word you said you would never thought you'd write those words. Um, that sounds pretty dramatic. Um, can you explain what you meant when you said that you saw Justin Trudeau's reaction to the 
the truckers, the anti-mandate truckers, as a kind of bid for tyranny. It's related to what we've been saying, I'm sure. Well, how is it dramatic if that's exactly what he did? He declared <clears throat> emergency, you know, invoked the an emergency act which suspended uh, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in certain key ways and allowed him to do totally illegal things like freeze the truckers assets and allowed him to threaten and Christopher Freeland, whom I know, uh, you know, like, really, I mean, I, I guess all I mean by that is she used to be like another scrabbling journalist mom in our New York City journalist circles. And, you know, then one day she said, oh, I'm going to, you know, go run for parliament in Canada. And I, I thought, wow, you must have powerful friends. And, you know, here she is. Uh, running tyranny in Canada, but uh, that's an aside. That's exactly w what he did. And it's not reassuring that he has backed off. I hope my essay, which explained to Canadian parliamentarians the danger they were in, mm -hmm. historically, this was at a an arrest or be arrested moment in the decline. Yeah, you pointed out that under the, under the emergencies laws, that, that the parliamentarians themselves could have been arrested without legal process. Yeah, and and you not just not just truckers. Uh, yeah, not just no. burly truckers. That's right, and and, <laughs> and so I, I I warned them. I, I hope it was helpful that Canadian law defines what Justin Trudeau did as treason, and there are very serious penalties for treason mm -hmm. in Canada as there are for, in the United States, and that uh, any citizen could. Um, also file a civil suit against Justin Trudeau for suspending their democracy. But yeah, the parliamentarians were in grave danger and any opposition leader, any critic, journalists, editors, history shows were in grave mm -hmm. danger. And the other real danger was those, um, you know, black clad uh, violent thugs um, who may or may not be, uh, you know, Canadian police or Canadian soldiers. And the reason I, I, I raise this is once someone declares martial law or emergency right. law, they can have their own armies. And right. and as a national security issue for us, the fact that our president declared extended open ended for the first time he did. in mm -hmm. hours that same week, instead of condemning Justin Trudeau and you know engaging in d diplomatic or other pressure to free the Canadians. And the fact that these this unlawful tyranny mm -hmm is happening right over our border, you know, it's a massive national security concern. And we are, we are also vulnerable, very you know, vulnerable right now. What's fascinating to me is that uh, Justin Trudeau asked for and then got parliamentary ratification and extension of the emergency. And then a couple of days later, he rescinded it. Yeah. Uh, and so when I look at that, I think to myself, well, I'm glad that it's been rescinded. Um, and I understand that people whose bank accounts have been frozen have had them unfrozen. Well, that's good. But nevertheless, am, am I right that I think what you're seeing is that there, a boundary or a norm has been breached and broken down by Trudeau's action. And even if he t has taken it back, the, the norm has been has been broken. And you look, OK, across the other continent now, across the Atlantic, we're looking at President Zelensky of Ukraine, who has just declared martial law. Um, in the context when Russian tanks are rolling in, I think I understand the declaration of martial law and its significance. But to think that Justin Trudeau thought that the truckers in Ottawa were somehow the moral equivalent uh, of the kind of situation faced by Zelensky's martial law is kind of stunning. Well, yes, but again, Graham, I'd like you to beware, like we're targets of a massive influence op is what they call it in the intelligence mm -hmm. community. And, you know, usually we do it to other countries, but now it's being done to us. So one thing to be super aware of is when you're being targeted with systematic propaganda, they want you to adopt a frame of reference or frame of consciousness that might not be organic to, to you. And, and, and I fear that, that even this model of like, it, like, let's give an example, like, okay, we'll take away mask mandates because the numbers have gone down, right? Well, no one has any right to impose them in the first place. So whether the numbers go up or down, it's a rights issue, right? So, you know, you don't want that kind of, if this, then that. Um, you've already, bought, one has already bought into a, an alien frame of reference that keeps us subjugated to the next, you know, you know, it, like 
flawed COVID data report. Um, and by the same token, it, it, it doesn't, it's not supposed to be, is there a crisis? Okay, it's martial law time, right? Martial law is the end of a democracy. It's, right. it's, it's the end, right? You, and, and once martial law is declared, it is virtually impossible to get a democracy back without a, a civil war, you know, and right. lots of bloodshed. So I don't think that, you know, people fight wars all the time as democracies. You know, World War II was fought by France and Britain and, and you know, as democracies. Uh, so I, I, I just am very wanting to caution us that we don't think, okay, well, if it's really bad, then of course martial law is fine. If it's bad, you need democracy more than ever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Isn't that true? And of course, it is stunning that in Canada, apparently, according to some polls, although support for Trudeau's actions certainly eroded over time, there's still a substantial a number of Canadians, potentially majority, who still thought that what he did and what he rescinded recently was just fine. Well, so again, that- let, me, let me jump in there. Like once you say we'll freeze your bank account if you give coffee to these truckers and someone calls you up and says, do you like what Justin Trudeau did, Joe Smith? You know that's already chilled the answer right. are you going to say that's right. oh, he's an ass you know like, <laughs> right. my bank you don't <laughs> you don't dare give the wrong answer exactly. yeah when your bank account's going to be frozen so you don't really know what people think but nevertheless it does drive me back to your comments earlier about the coalescence of elite opinion that that surprisingly vast numbers of people especially those whose opinions count seem to have acquiesced to this whole thing i'm looking at your other essay from january you said um uh, elite justice advocates enjoyed the celebrations of their virtues and of their values and did not seem to notice that they had become in less than a year exactly what they had spent their adult lives professing most to hate. And there seems to be, therefore, um, you're highlighting this massive passivity and submission. Is it a kind of hive mind? I think you may have used that phrase somewhere. What, what is this mindset and why is it so widespread and why is there so little dissent? Let's talk about that. I can't, I can't be inside the minds of these people who are making such morally disgusting decisions right now. I I try to empathize. I know they are subjected to relentless propaganda uh, in which, and I was just talking about this this morning, <clears throat> in which they're told that to, you know, to ex- to comply is to serve the community. I mean, our right. pres- that's what they're told. Yes, and which is already a CCP style way of thinking about us as Americans, right? It's already kind of dear leaderish. Um, but I, I also think I, you know, I can't give them a pass because I think there's also just naked self-interest. I mean, when you are part of an elite social circle. Your social circle is what's valuable in your life, right? It's the opportunities, it's that network. Um, and you go along with a lot of corrupt people in order to, I mean, it's our code, right? It's Omerta almost. It's like, oh, you know, Jeffrey Epstein was at events that I would go to, you know, held by Peggy Siegel. And I didn't feel personally responsible for Jeffrey Epstein. This was after his initial conviction, right? But, you know, New York always gives people a second chance. And, you know, you never want to give up your network if you're super privileged. So Mm -hmm. now you've got the president of the United States saying, if you are not vaccinated, you will have a winter of severe disease and death, not just for yourself, but for your, your friends, your loved ones, and your community. Right. So that gives a kind of patina of virtue to Mm -hmm. doing what's in your self-interest anyway and discriminating against people or not rocking the boat. Let me give you just one example. And I'm going to say it out loud. I'm a member of a of a club called the Common Good. It's a fabulous idea. It brings together people from both sides. Very high profile. Henry Kissinger is a member, you know, ambassadors are members. Um, you know, incredible speakers. So they're having an event Monday night for Huma Abedin, you know, the uh, colleague of Hillary Clinton's and Alan Patrikoff is hosting it. And these are big 
people in my world, right? And I keep writing to, and, and the invitation says vaccinated only. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I keep writing and saying, can I come? Will you tell me if I can come? I'd like to be at the event for Huma Abedin and Alan Patrikoff. Can I come? I spent $500 to be part of this, you know, community. Um, I'm not getting an answer. So mm. is that is that, what is that, right? It's just kind of an awkward social moment or is it kind of incipient 1930, 1931? Mm -hmm. You know, that's, if you, if you read the, this, I'm not making a comparison of my not being able to go to a party to, you know, 1930, 1931, but big picture, all the exclusions, all the children being bullied, all the people being shut down from society, um, all the voices saying unvaccinated people shouldn't get health care, unvaccinated people are useless eaters, essentially. Um, that That is evil. And, and people I know and respect who hold, like, as I wrote in the essay, this was the same, ga you know, gathering, the same club that held, um, you know, these wonderful events for Afghani girls uh, about how awful it was that they were excluded from school. And now I can't go to this event because I am excluded, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And there's no awareness of, of any continuity and behavior here. So I guess what I'm saying there is that I'm not in anyone's head, but right now it's uh, damaging to one's prospects and to one's career and to one's social life to s go to the restaurant and say, no, I'm here with my friend Naomi. We're not going to sit outside in the cold. It's 14 degrees. She's going to come inside. And that's, you know, that's how it's going to be. Like no one's sitting at the lunch counter with, with us, right? Right, right. But you know, what's interesting, it's not only those who decline to validate themselves as having been vaccinated, but also, as I think your experience suggests, those whose opinions or convictions um, don't correspond, that you can be excluded on that, but you're, and you're being excluded on that basis too, not just on the basis of you're not being vaccinated, but on the basis of your questioning well, uh, the consensus. I, I don't know for sure. Like it's, it's okay. you know, like I'm not polling people and saying like, you know, why, why are you, you know, why exactly, you know, am I excluded from this, this community? But, you know, some, some people have said, I'm, you know, I'm so disappointed in, in your stance. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and a, a young uh, would-be colleague has said, well, you talk to Tucker Carlson, you talk to Steve, oh. Bennett, you know, and so I, how dare you? Yeah. And I, I do think there's, I remember I was going to go see my mom and she lets me talk about this. This is not like being mean to my mom. She's fabulous. But I was going to see her and she's like, okay, well, I'm going to wear a mask and, you know, you've got to quarantine, you've got to test. I'm like, okay, mom, but you understand that I can't give you COVID if I don't have it. Right. And she's like, yes, but you'll have come from being on Tucker Carlson and Republicans mingle. Right? <laughs> and so she, you know, she, she already has this kind of anthropological instinct that, I'm around, you know, red state people, you know, bikers and, and Trump voters and, you know, and, and, and that that's kind of infectious. Heaven forbid. That, that, but that, that it's also in more infectious because yeah. there's something mm -hmm. kind of unclean about such people, you know, in the absence of science or reason. And right. she's- so They're ideationally enough. unclean somehow. It's, yes. And, and so, and I have a relative who said, I won't sit I don't sit outside with unvaccinated people. And and I, I said to my mom, look, does he wow. know that you can't, you just can't in infect someone outside, you know, at a reasonable distance with no symptoms, it's not possible. And she said, it doesn't matter, that's his belief matrix. And mm. so I, I do think that that's what we're, we're up against is a belief matrix. And yeah, mm. you know, when it comes to conservatives, I will detour to that for a minute, the mainstream media has done an incredibly good job painting anyone who's not in in the left tribe or a, a, who is god forbid an active conservative an active trump voter or even an active libertarian as um racist misogynist uh transphobic and uh you know ignorant and and anti-science and also an insurrectionist so now there right. is this kind of chill that mm -hmm. if you talk to those people you're supporting january 6th or you're you know mm -hmm. you're you're an enemy of the state 
and and that's you know if you study history that tyrants love doing that they love demonizing one group so much mm -hmm. that that other people are terrified just to be associated with them or communicate with them i would observe that um amongst the you know the the red state types who are who share some of your misgivings about the vac vaccines and the mandates and so forth um in that subculture, which is relatively powerless compared to the elite cultures, which has very little voice and very little sway. Nevertheless, in that subculture, you do sometimes see the reverse phenomenon. They won't talk to you if, you know, unless you're anti-vax or anti-mask. Really? Uh, oh yeah, there's a kind of harshness and a caustic rejection of anybody who doesn't agree with Tucker Carlson. Oh, that's too bad. Um, it, it is, there's a mirror image going on, but of course, what's different about it is that the one, the progressive side of the mirror image never allows itself to admit that it's a mirror image. Right. <laughs> because they're you. better than that. You know, I hear you. I, I have to say, I mean, people are, you know, rigid and foolish in both directions. But oh, yeah. I remember when I, I was uh, Jeffrey Tucker of AIR at that time, now of the Brownstone Institute. Yeah, I know him. Um, yeah, he's he's wonderful. And he was my mentor and he invited me to be a fellow at AIER. And I remember walking in and I was full of trepidation because a bunch of libertarians, you know, what's that gonna be? And uh, and I was astonished at how relaxed people were at when I said things that they totally disagreed with. And mm -hmm. I it's not until I began talking to libertarians and conservatives that I heard the phrase, well, I don't agree with you, but I really appreciate an open debate. I literally, it's been 10 years since I've heard that on the left. And mm -hmm. uh, it's beautiful. Like it's, it's what this mm -hmm. country used to be. It's what we're supposed to be. I agree. Um, turning a corner just for another segment of this conversation. We, we won't go on indefinitely here, but um, the, the panorama that you have portrayed of this remarkably widespread coalescence of elite opinion, people going along sheep-like and submissive, um, submitting to things that they would have hated in other contexts. It, it's disturbing and in a way that you call a, an unfolding drama at one point, which you say goes beyond bad politics. Um, you say it's metaphysically scary, and I think you're right. Um, this darkness, you said, has a tinge of the pure elemental evil. Um, one last quote from you. This is the January essay. Um, I don't think humans are smart or powerful enough to have come up with this horror all alone. Okay, now you're getting into territory that really breaks some conventions and some and some boundaries. But I was so happy to to read you say this, uh, Naomi, because there is something disturbing. There is something pernicious and malevolent about this kind of herd-like mentality and a lot of the, the excusing of the tyrannical moves by Trudeau and others. It's, it's, it's remarkably widespread, remarkably dangerous, as you pointed out, and um, hard to account for. What are you thinking? Yeah, are you, uh, are you asking me to talk about the God thing? You raised it in that essay, and I so did, I'm fine. allowing you, if you yeah. want to go there, please do. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, I, I, that's my guess, is that that's what, what we're talking about or what I'm invited to talk about. And yeah, it's true. Uh, I did kind of break a boundary there in that essay. I mean, I, uh, you know, I've always been interested in good and evil. I've always been kind of on a spiritual journey, whatever that means, but as a kind of highly educated Western intellectual, I was um, trained in a tradition in which you're not supposed to talk about having a fierce life um, and that that immediately declasses you and makes you kind of stupider and uh, not a real intellectual. And, you know, again, reading intellectual history, that's a, a real blip historically, because as you and I discussed earlier, um, yeah. you know, going back to Voltaire, uh, Jefferson, um, you know, Darwin, Emily Dickinson, Walt Whitman, uh, Jung and Freud, you know, a, a, all the great intellectuals until literally 60, the past 60 years, the post-war period did talk about God, you know, and, and it, it wasn't like antithetical to their intellectual rigor. It, it was part of their intellectual rigor, um, their, their faith life or their questions about what does this mean uh, in, in terms of the divine. Um, that's why I like Whitman so much. I wrote my thesis on Whitman. So, uh, I, yeah, so when it comes to that essay, I was confessing, and it's kind of a negative proof, but I was confessing that 
the nature, the sophistication, as I say in the essay, the glamour of the evil that I was seeing all around me, the fact that millions of people in lockstep were giving up free will and agreeing to exclude people and, uh, you know, abusing children with facial coverings and, um, you know, submitting to horrors. And, and also people were submitting others to horrors, right? Like, you know, the Gateses of the world and the, 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 the Borlas of the world and, and the Bidens of the world, to some extent, the Trudeaus of the world. Um, this didn't look like politics as usual. You know, even the worst <laughs> politics done by human beings has a kind of hapless and erratic quality. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and this just is so, it's like magnet filings, you know, all coordinating on this kind of unbelievable scale in one direction. Uh, at a level of sophistication and complexity that was really, I, I, I took my critical thinking, my you know investigative reporting mind, and I turned this phenomenon around from every angle, and I could not understand how it was made by humans. Um, and so I conclude, and it does, like I think we talked about this too, the way that Nazism feels different from Stalin's massacre. Stalin was just a, a horrible human being doing evil things, right? In mm -hmm. a kind of brutal way. But the Nazis had a kind of satanic glamour, right? It's a different feeling. Um, and and the, the and that's why people are so fascinated by the horrors of the Nazi period um, because of this metaphysical level of evil, right? So moving back to our time, what I was seeing around me I couldn't explain it. Um, and I especially couldn't explain this kind of mass hallucination and, and the, the anti-human quality of many of the directives, many of the policies. They seem to be about targeting the family, targeting closeness, targeting dance and breathing mm -hmm. and love and music and all the things that make us human, you know, targeting free will, targeting the body, which is made in the image of God, according to my tradition, you know? So I did conclude that I have to conclude, it seems that there is some metaphysical evil that can do more impressive things than human beings can do in the bad direction. And that as a consequence, I had to believe that there was also kind of proof of God as a result, because it mm -hmm. must be in pursuit of something, you know, that metaphysical level of evil, that intentionality, that scale had to be directed at something oppositely, you know, good and massive and redemptive. Otherwise, how could you account for it? Yeah, and I, I have no, I, I, I have no kind of material proof. And I really want to, you know, like talking about God is always very treacherous. And there's a reason I haven't wanted to, right? Because people of course. Uh, exert power and authority in the name of- They do. God. Religion has been used in that way many, many times. There's absolutely no doubt about it. And yet at the same time, our way of talking and thinking in public uh, in our uh, culture in the, as you say, the past 50, 60 years, maybe the past couple hundred years, um, at the elite level at least, we are afraid <clears throat> to introduce the question of what kind of malevolence is at work in human societies or sometimes in the human soul. We're afraid to ask that question. We're afraid to ask what kind of uh, supreme good might be so good that that malevolence would be wielded against it because we're afraid that if we introduce those topics, then we and others will just obsess constantly about them. Um, so intellectually speaking, for example, um, uh, and I'm speaking here as a Christian myself, um, the fact that there is supernatural causality at work in the world doesn't negate the fact that there's natural causality at work in the world, that their natural causality seems to account for the vast majority of phenomena, actually, but that doesn't prove that there's no supernatural causality. And when I allow for the possibility of both kinds of causality, I'm not obsessing about the one, actually. Yeah. Um, there may be a certain kind of uh, moral and spiritual naivete at work in Enlightenment rationalism or even in postmodernism. It, it seems naive to me to, to refuse to consider the immaterial spiritual sources of both good and evil. That's my thought. Yeah, well, especially since millions of people have had metaphysical experiences throughout history, um, it does seem to be closing the door on an aspect of, of human experience. But, you know, again, I just want to stress, to me, the only posture that I personally feel 
I should take when I talk about God or the divine or the metaphysical is one of absolute humility and yes. confession mm -hmm. of unknowing because I have no idea and I'm not, I never want to speak for anyone but myself. But but for myself, I can tell you, and I, I do feel compelled to start saying this, I don't, just like I, I couldn't figure out how an evil of the scale could be created by humans, I also looked at our situation. I do this like every day. I've been fighting this fight for two years now. And I, I, I looked at kind of our resources as humans, you know, the platform I have, the platform other people have, our human organizations, you know, money, fame, uh, organiz you know, activism. And, and I concluded that humans alone can't get out of this. You know, and that literally I am metaphorically, because I'm Jewish, so we don't get on our knees, but I'm I'm metaphorically, you know, on my knees because I think at this point it maybe maybe we are in an existential fight between good and evil at this moment in history. And maybe we do need God's help. And I'm not telling anyone mm -hmm. what to do, but I personally feel like I need God's help to get out of this because I can't get out of it by myself. I have some comments coming to me from participants. Um, here's one directly related. Um, isn't belief in God a harbinger or a bringer of tyranny to human societies? It certainly can be. I mean, that's thank you for that question. It's so important. It has been. I mean, you know, again, I'm Jewish. We've been hounded throughout the, the centuries by people who were sure God wanted them to kill us off or, right. you know, take right. our stuff or hurt us into, you know, bad places um, or, or, you know, in inquisition us. So uh, it's scary. I mean, to, to t even talk about it because the first use, and I don't think it's very godly, I think it's kind of satanic, but the first thing people tend to do with the power and authority of talking about God is, you know, is press their own advantage and subjugate other people. Absolutely. So, so I think, I think, you know, if we're, going to, so it doesn't have to but right but it's like money or it's like anything that's neutral it mm -hmm. can or not neutral it can be used for good it can be used for evil <clears throat> anything that's powerful right it can be used for good or used for evil um i i'm not telling anyone else what to do but i agree that a very careful care needs to be uh, held in one's heart when one starts to talk about these things so that one isn't coercing or browbeating or you know one is literally only exploring and sharing um and and even that you know with great tentativeness and hesitation uh but you know what atheism can be used for tyranny right tyranny um i think it has been deployed for tyranny yeah. Yeah, we'll both have right tyrants are going to tyrant both them. both yes and they they will do it in the name of whatever sells it you know right um one might even argue that um, while belief in God can be used as an irrationalization for tyranny, belief in God can also be a buttress against tyranny. And we've seen we've seen both of those. I mean, one of the, the great uh, things that I think uh, religion in the West has contributed is a place to stand where you can question the supremacy claims of Caesar right. or of any you know governmental authority. If, in fact, there is a God, then there's a place to stand to question the supreme cl authority claims of the state or of anybody wielding power. For sure, and it's it's the same reason I think that there's such a war on the family and of breaking parents, um, you know, primary decision-making about children. I, I'm so struck that churches and synagogues were shuttered for almost two years. I mean, a year into the pandemic, I had to leave my synagogue because they just wouldn't meet, you know. Wow. They had an, and this was synagogues across the region. Um, they right. had public health, experts on the board, not letting them reopen. And I guess I just want to agree with you, Graham, that whether it's God or whether it's family or whatever higher meaning one's life has, those are the things that do give individuals the somewhere to stand to resist tyranny historically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Let, let me, and in fact, sorry, 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 go ahead. Well, I was going to, talking about these things together, you and I and others, you know, like us, wrestling through the bo both the, the risks and the insights provided by uh, some of the historic religions that are around us and still living with us. Um, we need to talk about these things so precisely so as to figure out how to avoid the downside 
of the supernatural and spiritual dimensions of life that really exist. And we're silly to think that there's no spiritual dimension to human life. There always has been. So we need to talk about it and figure out how to avoid the downsides. If we don't talk about it, we're not armed intellectually. What, what do you mean the downsides? What are the downsides? Well, I mean, the misuse of spirituality, the misuse of religious claims that we were talking about a minute ago. I mean, it's, it's too easy to say, oh, well, anybody who talks to us about God, that he's just a naive, silly. That's one way of dealing with it, but that introduces other risks. So a complex, a high-level consideration of these issues actually can prevent both the misuse of religious claims and the misuse of anti-religious claims. I the mean, subject needs to be on the table. I, I hope so. You know, there isn't a good track record of talking about God without, in the next breath, beating someone up. But right. I, I guess for me, if if one is going to do that, I mean, I really want to validate the risks, right? Um, right? Especially to religious minorities, because, you know, your God, mm -hmm. Graham, may not be my God. And mm -hmm. I guess what I'd like to say is this could be like, if we do it right, an incredibly hopeful moment if we survive it, because just like I hope we emerge from this tyranny with a sense of individual choice and bodily integrity intact, I would like to have a discourse in which when I talk about God or you talk about God, we're only talking about our own experience. We're not then saying, and this has to be your God and you have to agree with me about what I say God is, um, because that would solve a lot of problems, right? Well, I certainly get the impression from talking with you, even this last little bit here, that uh, you and I, at least, and maybe a lot of people that we know could have these conversations, both about the, you know, the public issues as well as the spiritual issues in a way that could um, be fruitful and not just a dead end. I mean, we, I, I think those of us who are called to need to because everything we're doing isn't working, right? Everything we were told would save us isn't going to save us. Uh, all of all of the society we've built is imploding. All the institutions mm -hmm. we've trusted are falling apart. And, you know, uh, but I again, I feel like it has to be, it's so important that it's organic. Like, I don't want to oh, yeah. ever, mm -hmm. you know, drag someone into a discussion about Right. Spiritual no dragging. No dragging, exactly. <laughs> right. That said, I do want to talk about, like, one real kind of thorny thing okay. for me in this journey. But okay, it's go for it. You. So I'm Jewish, as I keep saying, I'm Jewish, right? Um, but I really like Jesus, right? And I really like Jesus as a rabbi and a teacher. And, a, you know, to me, he was the model activist and, and, and the model teacher, right? And so much of what I, I think about when I think like, how are we supposed to survive this? How are we supposed to live? You know, I, I get answers from his life and respectfully to Christians, I don't mean his life as inscribed in the theological construction that became the Catholic church or the Christian establishment. I mean, the, the kind of raw historical Jesus, you know, the kind of redacted historical Jesus who, taught people and served people and, you know, was unbelievably brave in, in facing down, you know, tyrannies of a scale, you know, that would even dwarf what we're looking at today. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just want to share that because it's mm -hmm. uncomfortable for me. I'm not a Christian and yet I'm a Jew with a really passionate, you know, sense that I follow Jesus as my rabbi. So that is like mm -hmm. a weird place to be <laughs> and maybe that's one reason i'm so scared of you know right. the immediate yeah. kind of labeling that people tend to do when they talk right. about god because i've struggled with the fact that i don't fit in any camp you know now mm -hmm. because of this you know very deep love i have for this rabbi and uh well, I just he didn't to seem that. to fit in camps and labels either did he he did not yeah indeed wow okay uh you and i have found something to keep talking about uh, for sure and I'm sure our friends appreciate that, too. We're going to stop here. It's always good to stop when you're on a roll rather than after your roll is over. OK, thank you for getting us on a roll, Naomi. We would love to continue the conversation. Um, we thank all of our friends around the country who've come to us through our various platforms, including from Naomi's own dailyclout.io, which I invite you to visit. Um, and thank you for joining us, friends. Thank you for joining us, Naomi Wolf. Come back again to Independent Conversations. Such an honor to be included. And thank you so much uh, also for uh, showcasing my work and for including me in your conversation. Oh, for sure. Okay.
Take care, everybody. Thanks, Naomi. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.